Okay, so for the last hour of Physics 1C for March 23rd, and we're going to uh, talk about what's called electromotive force now, or EMF. So electromotive force, or EMF, is a type of force that is placed on charges that are inside of a circuit. It's not really a force, but we call it electromotive force because it, it tends to act like a force. It's really a voltage that's measured in volts. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much uh, what we're going to use this phrase, EMF, when we're talking about voltage in the future. So we're kind of introducing it to you now. Now, in order to kind of understand what this is, uh, we have this picture of a battery right here, okay? Well, it's not exactly a battery. This thing over here is what we're going to call a source of EMF. Now, EMF is gonna represent really anything that can tend to drive charges through a circuit, okay? And here is our EMF source. Okay, um, I guess I could give you some examples. Some examples of a source of EMF would be things like a battery. That's usually what we'll try to use. It could be a generator, like a gas powered generator or something like that. It could be a solar cell. Um, what else is there? Can you all think of other ways that you can generate electricity? How else can you get electricity? Batteries, generators, solar cells, what else is there? About like a, a water wheel, a water wheel? So a water wheel would be an example of a generator. We'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. A generator is basically something that takes magnets and turns them, like rotates them so that you get uh, some kind of electrical flow. Battery generator, there's something else I'm leaving off here. Oh, um, what are they called? It's escaping me right now. But in the lab, we have these devices that uh, provide EMF. What are they called? Is it a DC source? What are those called? God, I've been out of the lab so long, I'm forgetting like really basic stuff. What is that called? Anyway. Would the uh, biofuels be counted? Or Biofuels would be an example of something. Sure, that would be something that you could burn, right? And then you could use the energy of the heat to 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 basically turn a turbine. So yeah, yeah, biofuels. Generate. It's gonna okay. be. It's gonna fall under generator exactly. Um, a lot of stuff is gonna fall under generator. What? I can't remember the name of it. There's basically something that's like a battery, but it's like a box that you plug into a wall, and then it gives you a fixed output of uh, of current. I don't know why I can't think of the name right now. AC power source? I don't know. Anyway, so um, those are all different sources of EMF, okay? And so here's what they kind of do. So in a battery, for example, you have one terminal that's positive and one terminal that's negative, okay? They're labeled in this case as A and B. And as a result of that, you have some voltage at point A and some voltage at point B, or sorry, not voltage, potential, some electric potential at point A and point B. And so the electric potential difference between these points, they call it delta V A B. I usually just call it delta V. You know, I, just, I usually just, just call this delta V. I think it's better. Where delta V is basically just V A minus V B. That's what they mean by V B. It's the same thing as this. V A minus V B. So that's the potential difference between these two points. And in case the symbols are confusing, this could be, for example, like 10 volts. This could be 0 volts. Lower potential, 0 volts. Higher potential, 10 volts, right? Okay, so now we look at a positive charge that's inside of our EMF source. Because the top terminal is positive and the bottom terminal is negative, there is going to be an electric field that points down within this system here, like this, okay? But the way that systems like this work is that they basically place an electric field. So just to, to, as a bigger example of this, so if I have the positive side of a battery here, the negative side of a battery here, and I place it into some kind of a circuit like this, 
even though the electric field within the battery itself points down, the electric field in the rest of the system points this way. So for example, once a charge gets to this position here, it's free to basically flow around here, okay? That charge will eventually reach and enter the negative side of your EMF source right here. When it gets to this point, it's basically used up all of its energy and it needs to be carried or ferried somehow back to the positive charge over here. So what happens to make that happen? There is in general inside of these EMF forces, some type of non electrostatic force that tends to move the charge to a higher potential. Okay. So in all of these things that I've written up here, there's some type of a force that's going to tend to take the charges that are positive from the negative side of the terminal and move them up to here. Right. And we call that a non electrostatic force because in the case of each of these, it's going to be something different that actually does that. Okay. So inside the battery, the electric field points down, but there is some device, there's some, some kind of operation that occurs inside of here that moves the positive charges up to the positive side, which then gives them energy that can allow them to be carried around to this other side right here, right? Okay, before going into detail about exactly what those things are, I'm gonna provide you with kind of an analogy for what's happening in the system right here. So an EMF source acts kind of like a water pump does. So that's the kind of analogy that we're gonna use here. So let's say that I have, um, like a fountain, okay? And I have a trough down here and it's filled with water. And inside of that, I place a tube right here. And this tube is gonna go, man, I cannot, I can't write straight today. I can't write straight. This is really bothering me. I'm gonna try to make this more straight. If it'll let me. Here. All right, so we've got some kind of vat and it's filled with water. We place inside of this vat a tube like this. And inside of this tube, we have some kind of a water pump. So this is going to be a water pump. Maybe it's electrically powered. That water pump is going to have the effect of drawing water from the bottom down there and forcing it to flow up this tube. So water is going to flow up this tube due to the pump. And it's going to flow back over to here until it basically starts to drip out of the uh, piece right here. And it will then go back down into the original source. And then the process can continue. So the water doesn't leave the system, basically, right? So this would be what's happening inside of a water fountain or inside of a faucet, let's say, for example, um, where the water is coming out right here. And then we're going to add one other piece to this. We're going to try to extract energy from this water by placing some kind of a turbine or something right here like a water wheel or something like that. So that this water wheel, as the water flows across here, the water wheel can turn, which means we now have mechanical energy, which we can use to do whatever we want to. We can use it to drive some machine or something like that. So we put a turbine here, it catches the water, the turbine uh, spins around, and now you have a rotating turbine that you can use to get mechanical energy to drive whatever type of machine you wanna, you wanna use, right? So this is pretty much synonymous with the picture over here on the left where the water pump acts as basically your EMF source. It's, it's, it's analogous to your EMF source. It's, it isn't an EMF source itself. It's just analogous to the EMF source. The water is basically just charge carriers or charges. And the tubes, well, those are like wires. And then this device right here is like a resistor. So this is how I kind of think about what's happening in type of these in these type of circuits. So the water pump acts as the EMF source. It's the thing that takes the water from a low potential energy down here, like low gravitational potential energy, and it pulls it up to a high potential energy. And once it's at that higher potential energy, it can then naturally flow until it reaches its initial potential energy down here, right? So you have the pump, what it does is it takes things from low potential energy and it moves them to high potential energy. Well, down here, this would be low potential energy, right? So the pump has the effect of just basically giving energy to the water, right? It endows it with potential energy when it gets up here that it can then turn into kinetic energy over here. And uh, yeah, there you go. And I guess there's one other thing that I left out, which is that the flow within the system itself is basically like current. In this case, it's water current, but it's analogous to um, electric current, okay? 
So the water pump is like the EMF source. Does that analogy make sense to you all? Yeah, that's a good analogy. All right, so hopefully that's somewhat helpful in understanding what's happening here. So the next thing we want to do then is to understand what these sources of EMF are and, and like exactly how they work. Like what is it about them, about a battery, a generator, or a solar cell that can act like a water pump in the sense of taking electrons from low potential energy and moving them up to high potential energy, right? Okay. So how do the sources of EMF work? So every one of them has some type of a non-electric electrostatic source. So I'm just going to make a little table here. On one side, we're going to have the source of EMF. And then on the other side, we'll have um, the non-electrostatic force that drives them. Okay, so we'll start with batteries. What do you all think that, so the source of EMF is a battery. Battery is something you can go buy and you can get a nine volt battery, a AAA battery, whatever you want. Um, what is the non-electrostatic force that tends to drive charges from the negative potential up to the positive potential? You don't have any idea? Or what's the effect? What's it? What's up? The how? What did you say? Is it like some chemical reaction? Yeah, some kind of chemical reaction. That's what's happening here, right? It's a chemical, I think they call it a redox reaction, maybe? Um, whereby, through some type of electrolyte that's inside of here, uh, along with uh, an anode and a cathode, you create a chemical reaction by which charges flow from the negative side down here to the positive side up here. I'm pretty sure that I have something linked on Canvas that I personally think is a pretty good uh, animation of how a battery works that goes through some of the chemistry and stuff like that. I'm not gonna go into details about it, but if you wanna watch that video, you can. Maybe I'll put it on after class is over. So yeah, there's some type of a chemical reaction that occurs that drives the charges. Okay, what about a generator? Does anyone know what it is that makes a generator lift charges from the negative side to the positive side? Is some magnetic force? Yeah, so this is a magnetic force. Now let's talk about this in particular because it was, uh, um, there were a few different examples of generators that were given, so we'll just understand how they work. I don't know if we talked about this in this class or not, but anyway. So how does a generator work? The simplest example of a generator, well, okay, there's, there's two different kinds you could, you could have. You could have a hand crank generator where you literally just rotate a wheel, okay, and you use that to generate electricity. That's one possibility. Um, or you can de design something that will rotate the wheel for you, okay? So here's the idea. If you take um, something that burns, so you have some type of a fuel, it doesn't really matter what it is. It could be coal, it could be um, biofuels, it could be whatever. You've got some type of a fuel, right? You set it on fire, so you burn it. And then what you need now is you need a boiler. And I'm just gonna set it up like this. We're gonna set it up so that there's a little spigot right here that steam can escape through. You're gonna fill it up with water. That water is gonna get converted into steam. And then just like when you boil uh, water on the stove in a kettle, that steam is gonna basically start spewing out of here like this. Right? And it's gonna it's gonna have a lot of kinetic energy. And then the goal then is to basically trap that kinetic energy. So you need to set up near next to this, you need to have some type of a turbine. It's a really bad looking turbine, we'll just do that. The flow of the steam causes the turbine to rotate. Okay. And then what you need, how can I draw this? The turbine itself needs to be attached to a magnet or to a coil, and you basically just need to rotate that magnet near the coil, okay? So the rotation of this turbine is connected to a magnet. Oh my god, I can't write today. Which is near a coil coil, by coil I mean a coil of wire, and this stuff, when you do this, when you rotate a magnet near a coil, leads to electric, oh, you can't read, ah, oh, you can't read any of the stuff I'm writing, can you? There we go. When you connect the magnet and you spin it near a coil of wire, 
that leads to electricity. That gives you an EMF. You could also say that it leads to an EMF, an electromotive force. Okay. All right, so we're gonna, this whole thing that's in a box right here, uh, I didn't specifically explain what's happening here, but we call it induction. You can read about it if you want to. There's a whole chapter on induction. We'll get to it in about a month or so. The process by which a magnet rotating near a wire can generate electricity. But that's basically the idea. You just need fuel, you need steam, and then you just make this thing rotate. Is that explained well enough? I left off one other piece here, which is that you also want to capture the... You want it to be a closed system. So you want something that can basically condense the steam. So you need like cool pipes up here. They condense the, the steam so you can flow it right back into your tube right here so you don't lose any water basically. So, yeah. Otherwise you need to keep filling with water because it'll obviously boil off. Okay, so that's a generator. It just, it, all it really requires is this last piece by the way. This is the generator. Okay, over here. The thing that rotates, which is the magnet near a coil that leads to electricity. Um, that's really the generator. So as long as you can get some type of a rotation out of this, you automatically generate electricity, right? So as another example of a way you could do this, you could just have your generator connected up to a falling water, right? That's what a hydroelectric dam is. It's just water falling over this generator will lead to electricity. You just need motion. And like I said, you could also crank it by hand if you want to, to generate this electricity. All right. And then finally... Another source of EMF was a solar cell. And a solar cell, the electric, the non-electrostatic force associated with that is basically, we could just say light energy. This is literally photons kicking electrons directly off of metals. All right, any questions about sources of EMF or where that electricity comes from? All right. So if you have an ideal source of EMF, which has no internal resistance, so ideal here means no internal resistance, then the potential difference between the ends of your EMF source is gonna be equal to the EMF, okay? So we use this symbol here for EMF, all right? And you can kind of see that in this picture right here. This picture shows different things that we have on our circuits. So if you see this in a picture, I'm gonna have to just scroll down and make this a little bit bigger, aren't I? Here's just kind of some symbols that you're gonna see show up in a circuit, okay? So if you see this, you see a battery and it's labeled with some EMF E and that EMF, you know, it could be something like, for example, 10 volts or something like that. You might see a problem where the EMF is just given as 10 volts, for example. Um, you're talking about an ideal source of EMF where the potential difference between the, the, the terminals is exactly equal to the EMF of the source. The reality is though that most EMF sources have some internal resistance to them. So you're gonna see a symbol like this to represent a source of EMF that has an internal resistance R. And for sources like that, we have this equation. So a non-ideal source of EMF, the terminal voltage is going to be slightly less than the EMF of the source itself. And it's going to depend on the current that flows in the system multiplied by the internal resistance of the source. So the actual voltage you get out of the battery that you can measure is not going to be the same thing as its ideal EMF. As an example of this, if you go buy like a nine volt battery, for example, and you take a multimeter and you actually measure what the voltage of that nine volt battery is, it may be slightly less than nine volts. 
And that's because when you actually pass electricity through it, the resistance of the source will reduce the potential difference between the ends of the battery. Okay. And we say that that term IR represents a potential drop across the internal resistance R. Remember that um, potential difference is related to current multiplied by resistance. And this equation, the way that I would write this equation, would just be delta V is equal to E minus I times R. This would be the, we call this a potential drop, basically. All right. So, yeah. Okay. I think we can do this problem now. I think we know enough to do this problem. So for the rest of this class and the next class and the next chapter, we're going to be starting to look at circuits and the way that they behave. We've learned all the terms that we need to know to understand how circuits work. This doesn't talk about power, does it? OK, it doesn't talk about power. So I think we're OK. All right, so it says a source in a complete circuit. It says we add a 4 ohm resistor to the battery um, of a different example that we're not going to do. We want to read uh, know what the voltmeter and ammeter readings are. So an ammeter is something that measures current. A voltmeter is something that measures voltage. And in this setup right here, what we have is um, a battery right here with an internal resistance of 2 ohms and an EMF of 12 volts. And we have a resistor that has a resistance of 4 ohms. And we're supposed to figure out what the readings in the um, voltmeter are, as well as the reading in the ammeter right here. And I think we're going to assume that the voltmeter is ideal, which means it has infinite resistance. And the ammeter is ideal, which means it has zero resistance. Our goal is to figure out what the readings on these devices are going to be. All right. So I'm going to draw my own. I don't. Do I have to draw my own version of the circuit here? Maybe it would help to do so. I don't know. So we've got a battery. It's positioned so that this is the positive end. We're told that it has some internal resistance, which is written as little r as well as its EMF source right here. We know that the EMF of the source is 12 volts. We know that the little resistance, little r, is 2 ohms. This is connected up to a 4 ohm resistor that we call r. And then within the circuit, we place an ammeter right here. And we also place a voltmeter right here. When we measure currents with ammeters, you have to place the current meter in, in, in series with the circuit. When you measure voltage, you have to measure it parallel to the circuit. Is that reasonable based on what I told you about voltage in the last chapter? That if I want to measure the voltage between this point right here and this point right here, which are being referred to as A and B. Does it make sense that if I wanted to actually measure the voltage, that I would place a voltmeter in parallel to the circuit? Why would I want to do that? Why would so I want to? What's up? In parallel series, aren't the voltages like, well, it was like for capacitors, they're the same, mm -hmm. right? They're the same, exactly. Yeah. So that means that whatever the potential difference between point A and B is here, it's going to be the same, for example, as between these two points here, because this is parallel to the circuit, OK? And I don't know if you don't remember what I told you about charges, but with capacitors, when you put capacitors in series, what happened to the charges on the capacitors? They're all the same. They're all the same, right? Well, it turns out to be the same. Same is true for um, current. And that means that, and, and this is really easy to explain because we can just use conservation of charge. If I tell you that the current flowing in my circuit on this side of the ammeter down here is I, so the current has to flow from positive to negative, right? So we know the current's flowing this direction, right? What does that current represent? Well, it tells you that that's the rate at which charges are flowing into this ammeter right here, right? Now, certainly, whatever charges flow into the ammeter must also flow out of the ammeter, right? Otherwise, there'd be charges that are kind of just building up in this ammeter over time until it becomes very, very, very charged or something, and then maybe it would dissipate. I don't know. Point is that any charge that flows in also has to flow out according to conservation of charge. 
So that's why when we measure current with an ammeter, you put the ammeter in series with the circuit. And when we measure voltage, you put the voltmeter in parallel to the circuit. If we were meeting in person, you'd learn all this stuff the hard way by doing labs, but unfortunately we, we're not doing that. So, All right, so um, there we go, that's our setup. Now we wanna calculate what the current is as well as what VAB is. We wanna know what the potential difference between these two points are. All right, so here is how we are going to do that. Points A and B not only measure the potential difference between or across the battery, but it turns out that they also measure the potential difference across the resistor too. So really, we can measure the potential difference VAB, which is the potential difference between points A and B, in basically two different ways, okay? One way to do it is to just look at this resistor down here and say, if a current I flows through this resistor that has a uh, resistance of four ohms, then Ohm's law tells us that the potential difference between the two ends of this resistor has to be equal to I times R. For the potential difference between these two points, we have an EMF source that provides us with a positive amount of voltage, or EMF, minus the current flowing through here, I times R. And this is again because, as we said above, for a real EMF source, the terminal voltage is always going to be slightly less than the ideal EMF. This is the ideal EMF of the battery. Okay, that's the most voltage you could get out of it. We're, we're in reality, we're gonna get a little bit less. So uh, let's solve for the current now. We know E and we know all the R's. So in order to solve for the current, all we need to do is just group terms. So we're gonna have on the right-hand side, IR plus this term. We're going to factor out the I. And then we'll just divide by that factor right there. And now we can solve. The EMF was 12 volts. The resistance big R was four. And the resistance little r is two ohms. So we end up getting that I is equal to 12 divided by six, which is two amps. We also wanted to calculate what this was VAB and I. So we can use the right-hand side of this equation now to say that VAB is equal to I times R. So it's equal to two amps multiplied by big R, which is four ohms. And we get an answer of eight volts. So in this particular problem, You have a battery that's, you could say that this might be what you, if you went and bought the battery, for example, it might say 12 volts on the casing. But in reality, when you go and you put it in an actual circuit like this, you find out that the potential difference is actually less than that, it's eight volts. And this is because the battery has an internal resistance to it. If it didn't, then the current would be higher, right? You can imagine if little r was zero, that the current flowing in the circuit would just be 12 divided by four, which would be three, and the potential difference would be three times four, which would be 12. So without the internal resistance of the battery, you would get 12 volts out of the battery, but we don't because there's always gonna be some internal resistance to the battery. This problem is kind of extreme, and uh, it's done so just to give numbers that make sense, but in reality, the internal resistance of the battery is probably gonna be a lot smaller than that. However, the internal resistance of a battery will go up over time, the longer you use it, until the battery basically will just be dead because there'll be so much resistance to the flow of current. Anyone have any questions about all this? About this problem? So the both the capital R and lowercase r are calling resistance? They are both resistance, yes, yes. We have a little bit of time left, so I might as well talk about electrical power since it's something we can talk about relatively quickly. 
Okay, so we've talked about energy and electricity. We might as well talk about power, which is going to be the rate of ele electrical flow. Oh, sorry, the rate of energy flow, right? And power in terms of electricity is actually really easy to calculate. So to find power in a circuit, all you need to do is to take the current flowing through the circuit and multiply it by the potential difference. And that's it. And to see why this works, you can kind of just look at the units. So current, right, is coulombs per second. And we multiply by potential difference. What are the units for potential difference? It's volts, right? But what is one volt equal to? Joules per coulomb. Yep, joules per coulomb. And so the coulombs cancel, and you basically just get watts or joules per second. Now you just think about it. I mean, current tells you the rate at which charges flow. Voltage tells you the energy per charge. You multiply them, you automatically get the energy per second, right? So that's how we calculate power in electrical circuit. And of course, we could we could calculate the power in this circuit up here if we wanted to, right? Because we have we have the current, which is two amps, and we can multiply by VAB, which is the potential difference, which is eight volts. And so we would get two times eight, which is sixteen watts. This would be the rate at which energy is flowing out of that battery, and also the rate at which energy is being dissipated by this resistor be 16 watts. So when you go and buy a light bulb, right? So if you buy a light bulb and it, it tells you that the, the power rating for the light bulb, let's say is like 60 watts, right? And let's say that you connect that light bulb up to a circuit in your home where um, the potential difference in the circuit is about 110 volts. Could you use this to figure out what the resistance of the light bulb is? So to understand how to do this, this equation could be written in a couple different ways. If we apply Ohm's law, which says that delta V is equal to I times R, then this equation could be written like this. Oops power can be written as replace delta V with I times R, you get I times I R. So you get I squared R. That's the power. Or you could also write it as if you wanted to, you could take I is equal to V over R and then you get V times V over R. So you'd get delta V divided by R times delta V, giving you another way to represent it, which is you just take delta V and you square it and then you divide by R. All different ways to calculate power or the rate at which energy is flowing in the circuit. So if I tell you a light bulb has a power rating of 60 watts and it has a potential difference applied to it that's 110 volts, then we can solve for the resistance over here because power uh, is equal to delta V squared divided by R, which means that the resistance is just going to be the potential difference squared divided by the power. So the resistance of this light bulb would be 110 volts squared divided by the power rating, in this case, 60 watts. You can also see that, uh, well, anyway. So then we end up getting 201 and 2 thirds. So basically like about, about 202 mm -hmm. volts. Now this implies that the voltage running through your light bulb is 110 volts. That may not be the case. Uh, if you're if you're plugging something into a wall socket, it may have something that downsteps the the voltage to a smaller value. In which case, the resistance would be different. But the calculation is is basically the same. So that's electrical power, basically. You want have any questions? Well, this is as good a place as any to stop. Uh, next time, we're going to talk about the effect of temperature on resistance. And I think that means we'll probably also talk about semiconductors and superconductors. So that'll be what next uh, class is about. And I'll try to show you all a video about how superconductors work. Ooh, that sounds interesting.
All right, so until next time, hope you all have a good day, and uh, I will go ahead and upload all the, the lecture notes that I haven't uploaded. I'll mess around with this and figure out how to get these things to start printing again. All right, so I'll see you all next time. Have a good day. Thanks, Professor. Take care. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. You too.